good evening everyone. Um, thank you very much for coming along and welcome to the second in the 2022 Philosophy Public Lecture Series of Big Ideas in Education, Past, Present and Future. I very much appreciate you um, braving, braving this winter evening and coming out and joining us. So my name is Sophie Scott Brown. I'm a lecturer here in the School of Philosophy and I'm one of the organisers of, um, of the overall series. Now, last week's lecture uh, explored the relatively neglected contribution of UEA's very own Lawrence Stenhouse to educational philosophy, theory, and practice. Um, and today, we're going to be turning to consider the present educational landscape. And we're going to be starting with higher education. So, today's session, which we're calling Beyond the Ivory Tower, addresses issues of inclusivity and diversity in the university. Now, these are two distinct but closely interconnected topics which have particular urgency and significance. I'm delighted to be joined today by Associate Professor Victoria Schwammi, who is from the School of Education in UCL. Victoria is going to be speaking a little bit later on on this topic of diversity and what this means for how we reimagine the university and its structures and its spaces. Now before I introduce her properly and hand over to her, I'm going to kick off tonight's programme by speaking on widening participation, its implementation and implications for higher education. So what we thought we'd do is give both talks first and then open up the floor to general questions or discussions or comments. Um, these are really huge themes, we know that, and what we have to say is necessarily going to be compressed. Um, we therefore hope that the discussion afterwards can sort of develop any areas that we missed or maybe we treated or skipped over a little bit too quickly. Okay, so without further ado, participate, a widening participation in higher education, a policy in four ideological keys. Okay, I'm going to start with some full disclosure here. I actually hold the post of widening participation academic officer for the humanities here at UEA. Now this gives me a reasonable familiarity with the subject, but I do need to stress here that the views um, I'm discussing here are my personal views and not those of the university, and certainly not a reflection of university policy. What is widening participation? Well, to quote from Hamlet, and who better to start off an educational um, philosophy seminar, but to quote Hamlet, that is indeed the question. What is widening participation? Now, while it is common in philosophy to start by defining one's terms, the ambiguity of widening participation is exactly my theme for today. Nevertheless, I will start with a briefly sketched background. So widening participation as the policy that's currently operative in universities today is most associated with the Deering Report, which was, came out in sort of 1997. And this came out in the first year of the Blair government, but it was actually commissioned earlier. Um, in fact, as the historian of education Nigel Ketley reminded us in his 2007 article, The Past, Present and Future of Widening Participation, it links back to and connects with a much longer history of state-directed reforms toward the provision of mass education. Now, various chronologies are possible here, but broadly speaking, we're talking about legislation dating from the late uh, mid to late 19th century, which was closely entangled with meeting the demands of a rapidly <coughs> industrialising economy. Educational reforms then gathered pace, um, gathered further pace, I should say, in the post-war period, which saw the beginning of a transition to the service and knowledge-based economy that obviously characterises kind of where we're up to today. Since 1945, there were a series of very well-known landmark educational reports and acts. These included things like the 1959 Crowther Report, which looked at secondary schools and started to talk about further education. There was the Newsom Report in 1963, which discussed secondary mods and particularly um, the fate of your average secondary modern school leaver. Then, of course, there was Plowden, which was primary education in 1964, um, and later on, the Educational Reform Act 1988, which introduced the national curriculum. All of these recommended measures to extend, enforce, and standardise schooling provision. Now, the most important, or perhaps more accurately, the best known forerunner to the Deering Report was, of course, the Robbins Report in 1963, which focused on HE and urged its radical expansion in terms of numbers of students 
place is offered, but also in terms of physical universities, and of course the UEA was a kind of outcome from that. This is a very crude, very, very potted history, but it serves to demonstrate how education always sits at the interface of social and economic forces. It is always political, and two sets of questions then always loom large. Who takes part in education and how? And what kind of education for what kind of society? Now, widening participation goes to the very heart of both of those issues. And yet, it's not entirely clear where that heart lies. Now, in thinking through this problem for myself, <clears throat> I found it useful to draw upon and adapt this diagram on transformational learning, which was devised by Sue Askew and Eileen Connell, researchers, or they, at least they were researchers, in the UCL School of Education. Their model fits because widening participation is intended to be a transformational policy. In other words, it aims to convert higher education from one form into another form. And I choose my terms carefully here because, as the diagram suggests, altering form in always implies change, but it can refer to very different orders and very different intensities and very different purposes of change. So on the one hand, you can bring, you can alter higher education, alter its forms, to bring it in line with changes already taking place within the wider socio-economic order. Or, at the opposite end of the pole, you can alter higher education to bring about, or at least to encourage, a different model of socio-economic order. Probably, you're always doing a little bit of both, but you may be more intent upon or more certainly more aware of doing one rather than the other. The wide anticipation policy exemplifies as well. As discussed earlier, educational reforms emanating from government are always entwined fairly explicitly with economic and or security objectives. Now, if you read the Deary report, for example, this is made perfectly clear. A post-industrial society needs a particular kind of skilled workforce, which in this case means technical knowledges, high-level administrative skills, and capacity for complex information processing. The flip side of this rationale is that an individual's social prospects, and therefore one assumes an individual's well-being, and certainly one assumes their willingness to cooperate, will improve if they can meet and supply the demands of said economy. So, the more embedded and valuable you feel you are to your society, the happier and more materially prosperous you will be. Why the participation in higher education in this key is about keeping pace with an economic transformation that's already taken place. Within this, there are different methodological approaches you can take depending on whether you favour the chicken or the egg. Or, in other words, if you believe that society makes individuals or individuals make society. If your priority is to provide a pipeline to supply economic need and fill key social roles, you're likely to adopt the more functionist stance down here. Um, <coughs> And adopting this stance generally means that you accept existing norms around objective knowledge, for example, or useful skills, and you concentrate instead on ensuring that people get access to them. Another approach is to remember that you, as a higher education provider, are increasingly a business whose success relies on happy customers. And given that your understanding about happy customer, as noted earlier, is someone able to access as many of the accepted goods of their society, for example, material comfort, recognised status symbols, approved values, as many of those as possible, you will develop and incorporate strategies to work on a more molecular level with that individual to make sure that they become fully assimilated to the requirements and values of their society. It's not enough that they simply do it um, and that they are better off and they are less at risk, arguably, if they actually want to do it. So that essentially covers sort of those two areas, the individual focus and the sort of outward more socially focused. This then might be said to characterise one half and within that two strands of the wide participation discussion. And this is the side most strongly represented by government public policy, policy analysts, but also increasingly business, university business planning and intelligence departments, and probably a fair few um, admissions professionals too. Okay, so that's one side. The wide participation policy is also attractive to those seeking more serious and perhaps more profound forms of social change. 
And again, these bifurcate into distinctive methods based on different assumptions about how to reach the same shared goal. As the diagram shows on the top right, social justice axis, and this directs learning in the first place towards a critical analysis of social problems. This is often, there is often, generally speaking, a strong Marxian inflection here that recognises that a socioeconomic system based on stratification and division of labour must inevitably generate social inequalities of various different kinds simply in order to actually function. That is literally built into the system. Um, to this is added more neo or refined Marxian insight that acceptance and consequently maintenance of these inequalities is constructed and conveyed in powerful and compelling ways through cultural resources, which include the university itself. This is not confined to explicit propaganda activities. I don't think anyone would say that that's necessarily what they were um, intentionally trying to do. But it is, it is deeply embedded, up, sort of functioning at equally at subconscious levels an entire substructure of discourse and practice. Now, this includes embedded into things like curriculum design as much as into curriculum content, into assessment methods, into approaches to teaching. So widely participation here would mean a total structural transformation encompassing curriculum content, delivery, and assessment in line with an alternative model calculated and, de and designed to ensure, to guarantee, total equality. Now, on the other side of the divide, what I'm calling, or what I'm borrowing um, Sue Askell and Eileen, Eileen Carnell's term, the liberatory approach, um, the liberatory approach agrees with the need for a fundamental transformation in learning culture, method, and practice, but switches focus to the learning individual and away from any one or particular learning model. And here, it is the learning process rather than the learned outcomes that tend to be the more valued. Now, these are, of course, all um, slightly caricatured. Uh, generally, widening participation as practice on the ground um, in universities sort of contains kind of an odd combination of all four, more or less active at different points at different times in different places. Sort of part of the reason why it's kind of difficult to make anything that you might want to call progress, because everyone's pulling in various slightly oppositional directions quite a lot of the time. Nevertheless, I argue that there is some important distinctions to be made in order, if we are ever going to aspire to kind of develop this policy more um, thoroughly and substantially. Um, I characterise this difference in terms, simply in terms of one of emphasis. If your concern is predominantly social maintenance, um, then you are widening participation in the current system. And your preferred mode of operandis might include some of the sort of um, support infrastructures listed here. So you might be saying that, okay, well, we will help more people complete their UCAS application as that point of entry. Or once they're here, we might provide extra mentoring programs to make sure that they can do what all their colleagues are more comfortable, confident doing already. Um, we might sort of factor in that this is a sort of difficult upheaval that might have an impact on emotional well-being, so we'll put more resources behind welfare and student experience, that sort of thing. What you tend to not be worried about is um, making any sort of more profound level changes at the level of teaching culture, approach, um, and that sort of area, curriculum design, if you will. If, however, you are seeking that more substantive and more sustainable, arguably social change, I would say that what you're hoping to do is widen participation. In other words, you want to move towards something that looks a bit more like a participatory society, that being your outcome, where more people take active roles in the organisation and management of social life. To equip people for taking on these roles, which is obviously what in education we're, we're trying to do, um, you will probably want to promote forms of teaching and learning which cultivate a certain intellectual disposition or attitude. Um, probably going to be characterised by um, emphasising qualities such as cooperation, tolerance, empathy, flexibility, creativity, independent reasoning, and so on. This then would require an attendant shift in the current conduct and culture of education practice. Now, so far, I've tried to indicate something of the complexity 
involved in widening participation in higher education. And I would like to conclude by briefly making a personal case for why I prefer, um, as a lecturer and educator, the liberatory method above the other three. And I have three grounds for this. Um, firstly, I consider it the position that is most logically consistent with the term itself. I agree with the social justice case that the socio-economic system based on stratification and division has inherent limits to participation. But I also recognise that any prescribed system, any system that prescribes certain identities as well, has the capacity to generate inequalities simply by regulating and determining the natural growth and course of development within itself. A prescription for freedom is still a prescription. A curriculum for freedom is still a curriculum. Uh, my second reason, I'm going to switch to the ethical there, because this builds on my previous point by acknowledging that while it is necessary to speak in terms of social groups when trying to describe particular processes of marginalisation, there still remains a danger of this becoming a reductive and potentially constraining identity label, nor are the recent appeals to things like intersectional identities always particularly satisfying, because sometimes, if not treated with due care and nuance, they can work out as the sum parts, sum total, or the sum of total parts on a spreadsheet somewhere. And I believe that it's only by allowing a more fluid, more evolving sense of social and cultural identity that these potential straitjackets can be ultimately avoided. And finally, my final point is actually practical. Quite simply, no curriculum, no plan of knowledge is ever going to be able to keep a pace with the huge changes that the world is currently undergoing economically, politically, socially, culturally, and above all, physically. It is then actually quite ridiculous to be setting what amounts to an arbitrary obstacle course and awarding those who wobble their way through it correctly points and praise. Frankly, this is just juvenile. We need to grow up <coughs> into the mature democracy that we claim to want to be. We need people who can think and think quickly and think flexibly and think compassionately. And if we don't gear all of our efforts to achieving that, then frankly no one can claim that the business of the university is education anymore. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, like I said, we're going to switch straight on to the second talk now. Um, I'll just get that. There we go. Um, it is my very great pleasure to welcome again Associate Professor Victoria Shromley. Victoria has a national and international reputation for her outstanding work on identity and leadership. The emerging themes of her research include gender, identity and race in the context of leadership and the implications of this for the experiences of learners and educators. In the early part of her research career, she focused on the experiences of ethnic minorities in ITT. Latterly, her research has spanned across two related themes. First, gender, education, leadership, and empowerment. And second, young black women's experiences of education in the context of their well-being. Victoria is the co-author with Dr. Carol Tomlin of the forthcoming Understanding and Managing Sophisticated and Everyday Racism. She is also the co-editor of the Bloomsbury Handbook of Gender and Educational Leadership and Management. And today, her talk will interrogate the rather uncomfortable gap between the claims made for diversity and the action taken in higher education settings. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much, um, Sophie, for inviting me. We appreciate that. It's nice to see faces. It's nice to um, be in, in presence as against doing this online. I really, really appreciate that. So thank you again. Um, I, I, may, I might do mine slightly different, so I may not be doing it the same way as Sophie does, so I do walk around a bit, so you have to kind of get used to that, I hope you don't mind. And so as um, Sophie's just mentioned, I'm going to do something on, um, and I've called it tensions between commitments and actions towards diversity. And uh, I will get you to speak, 
because it's not, not, not bad and so you can hear me easily kind of speak and say a few things. So I will get you to kind of interact with what I'm trying to do as well. I know I've got a certain amount of time, so I think at five minutes, if you can just tell me, when, at five minutes towards the end, okay, that'd be good. Um, so I think that the, for me, I want to really look at um, tensions between commitments and actions towards diversity. That's a really part of the slides, so that's what we want to say to you. Um, when we start to think about or acknowledge diversity, and I want you to kind of go back to how does that start to feel within yourself? Now, you may be the most committed individual throughout the university, in your student body, at home, wherever you are, workplace, etc. And um, you might think, well, you know, they're not speaking to me because I know everything. And I may just come along to this talk just to kind of, you know, uh, embrace that language, if you can, as I speak to doctor, a doctor, a comma, and I'm, 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 I'm okay, you know. Uh, but I want to do a little tiny exercise, which I do with lots of people. And I want you to take out the phone or a piece of paper or whatever you've got there with you. And I want to do this, which is, I want you to just jot down a couple of points, which is, who are you? Who are you? And only you know who you are, because you know when you look at yourself in the mirror, if you've got a mirror in the house, or you see yourself in the, in the kind of an elevator or something like that, and you kind of take a glance, why don't you just jot down, who are you? Think about it. And if you find it difficult to write down who you are, why is that? Have you ever been asked that question? Who are you? So I want you to do that. Just a minute. That's it. I do wander around, so I kind of like to wander around. I've got to speak as well. So, you know, you're just going to jot down a couple of points. So who are you? So a couple of questions I'm going to ask you. This is the first one. And then the next one, you've managed to write something down. It doesn't have to be an essay, just a couple of words. That's all you need to do, just a couple of words. Who are you? If you're looking around thinking, what does she want me to put down? Listen, it's down to what you put down. I'm going to make some kind of conversation around that as well. Next point is, where do you belong? Now, it all fits into this. I haven't gone completely cozy. Where do you belong is the next part I'd like to write down. Where do you belong? I know you might belong in the universe. I know you may belong to the human race. But besides that, where do you belong? It'd be very interesting to know that as well. And the last thing I would like you to just think about as we go into this is um, what uh, aspect of you do you find the most challenging? Now, I don't mean biting your fingernails or something like that. I mean, in relation to when you look at, so who are you? And then you look at where you belong. Which aspect of it do you think is the most challenging? When you're studying, when you're working, when you are just being part of the community, which part of that is. So I'm going to come back down here and throw out a few things again. This is just a little room up here, just to uh, um, get a little bit from you. All right, now I don't know any of your names, but I'm just going to just ask. First question, who found that really difficult? Who found that really difficult? Who are you? And so you did. And you two both you did, yes? Okay, you did as well. What did you find so difficult? The person in the orange shirt, Dumper, what did you find so difficult? I just have no idea what to say. You, you, no did, you, you couldn't hear me. Oh, oh, oh my God! No, no, no. I just have no idea, I just have no idea who I am. Anyway. You don't know who you are, you no, only took care. Good question, yeah. So, has it, have you ever been asked who you are before? No, no, I guess not, no. Okay, all right, thank you. And what's your name anyway? Oh, Gareth. Gareth. Gareth, Gareth. Yeah. Hi, Gareth. Uh, I didn't know how to approach the question. Oh, 
eyes. Have you ever been asked, who are you? Probably like at school or something. Right. Probably something like along those lines. Um, when people ask you what you want to be in the future, that's the kind of question they'd ask. But yeah, no, I haven't been asked that question. All right, hold on to that. Thank you, Alex. I won't go to Sophie. I'm going to go to yourself. Are your names? Davide. Sorry, Davide. Oh, Davide. Yes. Okay. So, you were the that was really bad difficult. What was difficult? Yeah, well, I was thinking, I don't think anyone asked it. To me, or at least in a very direct way, mm -hmm. so that they would ask me to really think about it. Right. And so it just felt to be like a, I suppose, a, a, no, a novel or an unexpected question. Right. Yes. So I, yeah. I like what you're saying. It, it's very interesting. So I'm going to come back to you. And you are? Steve. Hi, Steve. So my partner here is Russian. Yes. In order to get her to come to England, we had to run the gamut of the home office and we had to go to court and etc. And the whole process involved then questioning who we were. We had to constantly justify who we was. We went to court in front of the judge, he made the decision. The home office guy, even with about 500 words, 500 pages of evidence, plus letters from MPs like Clive Lewis and so on supporting us. And I teach at a, a very small vocational further education college and what we do is we teach the guys that are basically county lines, all the guys that cause all this trouble, they're my students at the moment, yes. and so on. And that was how it was who we are, yeah. And um, but the whole process involved us trying to prove who we were. Right. It's very interesting to go. So through. you so, so you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I yes. Really because if you've never been asked, so who are you? Now I don't know who you would, but you're walking along in knowledge and you can assimilate. Some people can assimilate into what? Whiteness. You assimilate into whiteness. And it's not until somebody hears your accent and they think, oh, sorry, who are you? Where did you say you came from? He said, I didn't. But they listen to your voice. Or you say your name. And then that's when they think, oh. So the next question is going to be, so where do you belong? Yeah? You see how it connects? So who found that? question quite difficult or easy. It's not that an easy question to ask who belongs to. Let me find where do you belong in Yes, at the back there. Who are you, my dear? Um, L. L. Hi, L. Why do you find it so easy, L? I'm going to be a couple more minutes and I'm going to move on to my other slides. Yeah, I controversially put Suffolk, so I'm from Suffolk, and yes. that was my first thought is that I, I feel very connected to my family, my friends. And even the cult, the physical landscape of Suffolk feels like it's in. I didn't even grow up in Suffolk. Well, so I feel like I belong there. All right, fantastic. Yeah. You found yourself. You found belonging there. Thank you, Elle. Anybody else, very quickly? Anybody found belonging difficult? Where do you belong? Yes. And your name is. Dan. Dan. Okay. I've never really felt like I belonged in this society, to be honest with you, right. at all since I was a child. Okay. So with that, so when you, you don't position yourself, you just find it quite difficult. Yeah, but I, I had to answer with the thing, no, I don't know where I belong because I've never felt like I belonged anywhere in any class, in any any part of society. I've never felt like I'm 100% in any. I've like a foot here and a foot there always. Do you know, I know how you feel. I grew up in Somerset and I was adopted by a German-Jewish parent who lived six months. <laughs> so I mean, I'm a bit yeah, complex. Sure nice exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and on top of that, they're very upper class as well, so you've got all those complicated things in there which, which makes it very, very difficult. But yeah, I understand what you're saying. And the final thing I asked you was, um, so um, which bit of you do you think is the most challenging in the workplace or as a student or whatever it might be? What bit of you do you think in relation to who are you? This is going to come back to what I'm here for. Don't worry. Um, anybody want to shout out from the back there? Um, the, one, the person there with the laptop, which is Apple, I think it is, with pink on it. Yes. Um, take it, risk. Move it from job to job. You need to shout, dear. Take it, risk. Try new things. You'll come here. The microphone there. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Bonke. 
Try, right, okay. Yes, what, anything else? Um, challenges and perhaps dependence. So if you have to be earning a certain amount, you want to try something new or you're only qualified to do something, but you are trying to get somewhere. All right. Okay, so yours is specifically to your kind of professional kind of identity, what's going on there, isn't it? Anything else? What about being a white female? Is that a challenge at times? Sorry? What about being a white female? Is that a challenge at times? No challenge at all. That's an interesting one. Uh, okay, let me ask you a question. What about being a black female? Is that a challenge at times? Sometimes, yes. Yeah. Sometimes, yes. Okay. All right. I'm going to get you all involved, you know, because it's a small thing. Right. I did that deliberately because if you come in here to listen and understand tensions between commitments and actions towards diversity, you need to have a conversation with yourself. You need to have that conversation with yourself. Because it's not about the other, because you're all sitting there as racialized beings. Yes? whether you're white and you're all right, or whether you're brown and you stick around, or whether you're black and you don't come back, you're all racialized beings, and you need to understand what that means. So I need to kind of do that with you, so you can start to come with me on the journey, which I'm going to take you through quite simply. OK, so this is going to work, I think. Yes, it is. So um, let's look at this. So what do you say? What does this university say? I had to go through a load of stuff to try and find, try and find a little bit, which was just small, which was, look, the university is an international and multicultural community which values and encourages diversity and is committed to providing a supportive and inclusive environment to staff of all racial groups. Isn't that wonderful? There's nothing wrong with that, is there? Anything you want to know? Right? It's a good start. It's a good start. And, and, I, and I, you know, I like to have a good start. But anybody want to say anything to this before I um, tell you a little bit about it? It's not, I'm not going to criticise it. Don't oh, worry. What jumps out at you when we think about this? Well, let me tell you what I think starts to jump out. I'm starting to think about the environment the environment itself. I'm also thinking about the culture. What's the culture like? Now we can of course have an international multicultural community. What's the culture like? What's it actually like to be here as a student or member of staff? Whatever the member of staff is. What about the structure? What about the structure? Structure meaning policy policies, and all those processes, and all those regulations, and all those types of things. And then, of course, marketing, the brand. It's the brand itself. What does that mean? And then we come on to people, the community. How diverse? What do we mean by diversity? Do we mean when we think about a packet of smarties with all the different colours and all those types of things that are very diverse because we've got all different people looking like certain aspects, or we've got all different sexualities within the room, or we can show them we've got disability, and we've got show that we've got age, etc. Or is it about accessible? How accessible is that actually happening within here? And then we look at progression. Progression or attainment, attainment for students and progression for colleagues who have been stuck on a particular grade for the last 10, 15 years and can't move upwards because they can't, because there's yet another set of criteria to be able to get to the next step. We look at attainment, how many get firsts as a first in an undergrad or distinction in a master's or the PhD doesn't have to keep going back for amendments, all those types of things. What's going on in that particular area? And also, who gets the opportunity once they've finished? If they're going to do a PhD and they've finished, who gets the opportunity to work with Sophie, for example, 
or just so you choose somebody which looks like her to work with her because it's easier. All right? These are the things we're going to have conversations about. I keep forgetting I've got this in my hand. Oh, oh God, what happened here? Oh, G-O-T. Oops. Okay, so how do I make it big again? Shift that five. I should be able to do this, shouldn't I? Yep, okay. Look, I want you to have a look at that picture there. And see what you think. Tensions, commitments and actions. Just write down one word, one word as you look at that. You think about tension, what do you, what do you see on it? And then think about commitment and then action, so we're going to continue. But I want you to look at that there. This is 
a question which Sophie gave me. This is my essay question as a thought to try and do something here. So what are the moral commitments to diversity made by universities and the challenges of translating that into meaningful change at structural level? Yeah. So the challenge is number one, I would say, is knowing yourself. How can you even engage with this particular topic if you don't know who you are? If you always defer it as the other, the person in the burnt orange top, because I've got a top like that, and I've got a running top like it. If, it, if you already refer to yourself as that or the other person, you're never going to actually move anything forward because you have to have that conversation with yourself first. You have to see what you're looking in the mirror. If I see myself as a gay woman, I have to have that conversation in, in, in the mirror myself to be able to have that conversation. Also, the challenges are committing, making that commitment, not just on the paper, but how does it come off the paper to become reality? How does that happen? So it's not just about quotas, but it's about the fact, how do you kind of, how, what's the environment like to have that conversation, that critical conversation in the staff room? When someone says, what's your name? Alan. Alan. When someone says, an Alan, Alan hears something in the staff room, which makes a kind of a, a joke or does something like that, and you feel uncomfortable about it, but you're not quite sure how to tackle it, because it's your dean of faculty. And you think, what do I do? Do I say that I don't really like what you're doing? And, and do I put my PhD on the line? Or do I kind of tackle the person and say, what you're saying is not, it's not, it's not appropriate? Is being able to have that, is your environment aiming like that? Or does it mean you kind of suffer in silence and think, let me just get this thing done, and then I can move on? I don't know. They're the difficult things you have to be able to ask. And they're the kind of strategies or the kind of challenges that you're facing with. Can I have a real conversation in this environment? Or is it a superficial one? And I think that's important. Another challenge you're looking at as well, it costs money to make a change. We can all say, yes, we all want to make things happen, but it costs money. For me to come here, I was very happy to come here. I didn't get lots of money or anything like that. But I was able to get my train fare paid for, and I could come and stay the night. Normally, you're running around, giving everything free of charge. And uh, unless I was a top notch in the philosophy, I may have got you know, something else. I don't know. But it costs money to make change. If you want to bring people over to be part of the conversation, you have to put your hand in your pocket. That's a challenge. Because everybody's going to say, no, I haven't got the money, I'm so sorry, especially academics. I'm really so sorry. Whereas me, I go to business. You know, and I, I make my daughter laugh because she says, I say, she doesn't think my jokes are very funny. And I said, I got paid X amount of money for being funny the other day, going to court for in relation to equality. So um, she said, oh, well, that's because they don't know you, Mum. I said, well, that's, that's, that's interesting. Um, but look, challenges. If you're good at something, sell it. Why not sell it to the private sector? Sell it to get some money back again. I'm a bit of a hustler. Right? The challenge is also making sure your research reaches out to people in a diverse community. Otherwise, you're just looking at yourself. You need to ensure that that happens at the same time. Uh, Translating it into meaningful change of structural levels. The structure strangled us. That's what strangles us completely and utterly. And it's, and it's how you then start to think, so what needs to change within the structure? Which people are moving up the ladder? Now, I don't know what your numbers are in this, in this organization, but I can talk about this here. Out of 8,600 members of staff, uh, academic staff, not members of staff, academic staff, how many of those do you think are black academic members of staff, which are from kind of grade eight to 10? How many do you think we've got out of 8,600? How many? Yes. Yes. Um, I'm just kidding. Well, are you counting? Well, no, no, no I, heard, I heard someone say that it's actually really bad in academia, so I've gone for a really radically Come on. low number. Come on. 
twenty or something. Ooh. Is, it, is it that bad? Ooh. You said twenty. Anybody else on the same house? Eight thousand six hundred, and we've got how many? What's your name? Ooh. <laughs> Not quite that bad. Not quite that bad. <laughs> Now, I have to be very careful because I can talk for hours, you know. Um, so, it's that one here. What's the challenge yet? Right? You think that is all philosophy? international as you thought you were going to be and so even though you may speak three languages you weren't able to get that or for example that you know um doing the promotion uh i know you're disappointed but come back again in two years time and then we'll see if we can give it to you then but um 
I really might have gone to court and tackled him, tackled him to the ground and said, you know what, I'm going to get this. Because otherwise, I, I don't want to wait two or three years' time. Because you really get told you're too young or you're too old or you're too this or whatever. No, you're not going to wait for that. So I put that up there because we want to be able to do, we want to check the balance a bit. We want to check the balance. So we start to look at it through a different lens. We look at it through a different lens. That's what we're wanting to try and do. Now, um, Sophie, I know that uh, I'm nearly run out of time, haven't I? Am I all right? No, you're fine. Am I? Okay, how long have I got left? Ten minutes. All right, okay. I like that. Because it's, it's, this is where it's at. But you want to turn yours around. Now, Claire's saying that you're starting to turn yours around in certain departments, which is good to see. That's good to see. But I want you to say that. So people came to knowledge. So if somebody came from a historically black um, university and wanted to come to knowledge, you go put your hand on your heart and say, you know what? Yeah, you'd be very welcome here because it's it really is uh, a curriculum which you'd be very familiar with, and there's lots of lectures, academics who'll be able to participate in what you're doing, and also other things. You're still, but you're still still learning at the moment, aren't you? Let's look at this one here. So let's go back to what I was saying to you before, which is around tension, commitment, and action. I've got an onion on there. Sorry if anybody doesn't like onions. I mentioned something about food the other day in a lecture. I wanted some, some of you in the lecture said they have an issue with talking about food because well, they've got issues with food. I said, I'm so sorry. So if anybody in here has got an issue with food, I apologize, but this is an onion. So, um, I'm just saying it's an onion, right? And it's got different layers. So I want to think about this many layers that you within the university, whether you're a student, whether you're a member of staff, whether you're a member of faculty, whoever it is, how does those particular tensions, let's think about the tensions. So the tensions, what we're dealing with in diversity and what that means on multiculturalism. Now, of course, one of the tensions about is the terminology of language. How do you describe Victoria standing here? You might be a bit nervous to say, well, she's a woman. Yes, I know, I'm a woman. Yeah, OK, that's one thing. But the other thing is, I'm not sure whether to talk about her sexuality or not. But you know, then ask me, well, I'm not sure we use that language. Or, um, and also, I'm not sure. And I say, it described me. Well, I like your hair, Victoria. OK, do you want to talk about my hair? What else do you see about it? Oh, I like your boots, Victoria. OK, you like the boots. And what they don't talk about is the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is what? What's the elephant in the room? Your colour. Oh, my goodness. Exactly. They don't want to say, you're black. I say, yeah, I am. When I woke up this morning, I was black. When I went to bed, I was still black. So we don't want to talk about that because that's a difficult conversation. It's part of a layer. If you can't get comfortable with the language, you're stuck. Whether you use BPOC, whether you use black, whether you use white, whether you, whatever you use, you used to have something to make reference. Yes? I do have a little bit of struggle. This is a, a little bit. I'm going to throw something in. When it comes to colorism, and we talk about brown. Okay. I have a bit of a problem about that. And let me tell you a little story about it. The reason why I have a bit of a problem about it in this country, not in America. America is slightly different. Because in America, we're talking about um, Latino and Puerto Rican, which is a very different discussion. Well, in this country, I'm a little bit nervous what's going on with the brownness at the moment. Um, anybody think why I might be a bit nervous? Well, let me tell you. So in this country at the moment, there's people saying, look, I know I'm not white, but I'm brown and I'm all right. Do you know what I mean? I'm really all right. Until you walk along the area, right? Then you walk along the road. They don't care if you're not brown or black. They're going to call you the N-word anyway. Do you see what I mean? So what we're developing at the moment is I'm brown and I'm all right because I'm not black. Because who wants to be black? Look at all the various challenges of being black. So people want to walk away from that. You listen to the news. You listen to how people start to describe themselves. They don't want to be associated. And most of the time, it's going to be coming from Asian communities.
communities who perhaps don't want to be connected with somebody who is black, but also somebody who could be mixed heritage, who perhaps don't want to get involved with their side of blackness. But at the same time, what I try and work with, and I'm doing this in the, in, with students, but you're not white. And so, you know, whichever different coloration you want of shadism, because that's the terminology, you're not white. And once you're comfortable with that, you're good. But if you're all trying to find out a different aspect, and when you look at, that's one of the layers here, finding out which language you're using within the university. Please don't call me coloured, because that's a different conversation, right? But you do need to be able to have that conversation and feel comfortable talking about it. Of course, the other layer is, is uh, do we want to have tokenism? We want to diversify the organisation. We want to recruit more people. But is it about tokenism? Or is it when you bring them in, they leave again? So they come into the white space and they want to be part of it. They want to kind of really get down, roll their sleeves up. But then why is it then they don't stay long? Or you bring this amazing man or woman to come in to do something with you, and then they are positive and everything else, and then all of a sudden, white fragility takes place. And where the person was a positive experience within the university, you then become the problem. And so where you came in as a pet dog, you then come out as the problem. And so it's like a revolving door. You come in and you go back out because you're not playing as a product anymore because you've said something. You've criticised the white saviour. I'm using terminology just to get the conversation going. The white saviour brought you in because the liberal person is sitting around the recruitment part, right? They're sitting there in the, in the actual recruitment team. They fought for you. And you need to be grateful that you've been fought for you. And now, you turn around and say, and you're going, you're going against me, Alan. I'm now challenging you. And you say, Alan, I'm Victoria. But I, I fought for you to get the job. I'm on your side. And I'm saying to you, no, you're not. Because you're just part of the same system. You need to challenge people with me, Alan. Yeah? So this is what we're talking about. So that's another one of the layers. So it's sophisticated. Very sophisticated. The other one is you get the HR involved. HR do some more policies, let's start thinking about what we need to do. The policies are going to help us, they really are, because without HR, what can you do? But how radical are HR? How radical are they? Yes? Yeah. Oh, very good. All right. So you've got a whole range. Now, in the heart of that is the culture. It's the belly of the beast. If I'm going to come and work here, I need to feel that I'm going to be supported. And when I tell you that I feel it, I need you to understand that I feel it, but I don't make it up. It's not in my head. It's not like the feel. I didn't feel out. Get out. That feeling. It's not in my head. It's really, I feel it when I walk into the meeting. I really feel that they don't really want to understand the knowledge I'm bringing to you. Maybe because I'm not quoting 10,000 people, but I can quote as many people as you want. And I always say you need to read about it. So the layers are really many, many layers. And you could use that to do all the different layers you want to do. Now, when you think about the assessment, and of course, you've all got to be able to write 5,000 words, 10,000 words, whatever it is. But do you turn it around in its head? Do you turn it around so it's culturally? So you make a different cultural mix? One of the things I do with my students is I teach them sociology of race and education. When I took it over, I was the first black person to teach that module in the institute. It's always been taught by a white male and then a white female. And then I got it, I just transformed it completely. Everybody, everybody who's on that program who teaches with me are black. Everyone, all right? Now, I'm not doing that because I'm cutting everybody out. Why can't my students, who come internationally from all over the world, have a team of black scholars from all over the country, all over the world, teaching the program? And they do. 
And the students have said it's transformational. How many of the students are white, come from Mexico, Japan, China, all over the place. What's interesting is the assignment. I get them to do assignment, which is uh, they look at an autobiographical account of as a racialized being. They can do a traditional essay, or they can do this. And what you get back is amazing, you can imagine. Because they're using the lectures, and they're writing about themselves to a racialized being. And it's really, really, really powerful. So I haven't filled in all those, but you can fill them in when you've got a minute. You can fill these in, think about your university, and fill in the other ones. So, so why is it actually like? Who cares? Are we actually really, do we really want to do much around diversity within higher education? You know, you should be honoured to come to higher education, not feel you've now got to diversify it. What the hell? You know? But of course, it, it enriches the educational experience. My 17 year old, just today, was talking to me, and she was opening up a little bit about her experiences at school. She's a young black girl, she's six foot two, uh, doing maths and art and economics, dropped RI, because she couldn't, she couldn't cope with the fact of having a debate about is it a chair or not a chair? She said, oh, I can't do all that one. This is just, this is not me, I can't do all that one. I said, oh, come on, Charlotte, it's quite good, no. So, um, so she decided to do an EPQ, which is quite good because it's a research thing. So she's doing that. However, she was talking about, oh, should I, I've signed up for a workshop. I saw about this workshop on Charlotte today. Um, whether to go and see Chat Cambridge or not. I said, well, go and have a look at it. And she said, oh, I don't know, I don't think I'll get in. Why don't you get in? Right? So diversified in, enriches the educational experience, but they need to feel that they're, people coming here need to feel that they're going to be wanted and they're coming because of a reason. These diversified challenges, stereotypes, and preconceptions. You may have a preconceived idea about me when I came along, you might be asking me to talk about this, this, and this. Hopefully, I broke down a little bit of that. I have no idea. Maybe I may send you to sleep. And that's okay too. Yeah, we need to sleep. Many times we sit in the lecture and we're fast asleep, and so you start snoring. And I go, oh my God, you're actually snoring. What's going on? So, you know, the stereotypes. Who am I as a young black woman? Here I am standing in front of you. You might think I was going to do X, Y, and Z. And I might have done, I might decide not to, depending on what, you, what I want to do with you to be able to get something from you. And look at this young man here, you know, trying to work out what they're saying and thinking. Hopefully you'll talk to me at some stage. It also encourages critical thinking. I am so hot on critical thinking. You've got to be able to do that. But also understand that the students you're bringing in, or the staff you're bringing in, may not think like you, Alan. Do you know that, Alan? I may not think the same way as you, but that's okay, isn't it? Because we can have a debate. Don't need to have a puncture, but we can have a debate about it. Which is important. I'm not going to come into my solution. All right, so encouraging critical thinking and help students to learn to communicate effectively with people. That's been a hard one this year, the last two years, because of looking at the screen and how you communicate, because it's just the screen. And you've got the, you know, you're shutting down the camera. You think because I'm sitting in bed, whatever you're doing, all that type of stuff. And also, of course, it strengthens communities and the workplace. That's some of the reasons why, but at the same time, I can say Claire at the back there, right? It's great to see your hair, or I can say something else. But if you don't have that kind of conversation, you can't have a banter about it together and say, look, you, you know, it's nice to see you, it's not nice to see you, whatever. You can't have that with a, if you haven't had the grounding of critical conversation about what's the elephant in the room. That's really important. And I suppose the last one is how do we promote a cultural diverse awareness on campus? You've got a campus which is on site. How do you, how do you promote that? We need to set the tone. It goes back to the culture. It's a challenge. Because at the one time, you want people to kind of be able to open, open up and be able to have that debate. On the other term, people are getting platforming. 
and so you can't say certain things. But you don't want people to say certain things you can offend people who are really kind of so the so the university then gets taken to court. But you do want to be able to have a conversation because I want to talk about certain things. I want to talk about the fact that you know I want if people want to talk to me and say oh it's okay for you you're, you're privileged. Well actually you don't know what I'm privileged. You don't know who I am. You don't know what my experience is as a young person growing up in a white space in the age of six months. You don't know what that was. But you think you might know. So you know, setting the tone for the out of the conversation. Of course, degrees of education. I'm very much involved with this at the moment because Charlotte will be looking at what she wants to do. But she's looking at a mix. So in some ways she's looking at liberal arts. So she wants to do architecture, but she's not sure if she wants to do engineering mixed with that, or whether she wants to kind of put something else in it. So people are kind of looking at kind of a bit of a hybrid model for their kind of degrees, but also people want an interdisciplinary approach to their work as well. I was never able to be fit, fit in somewhere because I've got one foot here, one foot there, and another foot. I have my business as well. So I like business along with academia and how that makes, how it works with each other. Uh, making diversity awareness activities, ac activities a party type thing. Well, I could say something about that, but I'm not going to, because I think of the present current environment we live in. Um, but uh, I was going to say about the activities otherwise, um, yeah, I, I think people are done now with, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, the bias, anti bias, and implicit. Yeah, implicit, and, you know. I can't remember what the name of it is now, that training. I think the people who need to understand that that's not quite right now. Um, the awareness training, teachable moments, they're really good to do them because it kind of brings people into this narrative, isn't it, really? And uh, promoting awareness and artistic uh, um, exposure. Of course, you've got creative arts here, and you know, creative writing. I like the narrative. So, anyway, that's me, and that's a little bit of what I can tell you. I think I might have one more thing to mention, but otherwise I think I'm done for Sophie to hand back. Um, yeah, I think the rest have come out in questions. If they've got any questions. Oh yeah. There you go. I'm not very good at doing that. Sophie kept nagging me to do that, but... Uh, so there's two books on there. Um, I need... I led the one which is the... Um, uh, the first one I led on that, um, it was a, a colossal 26 chapters through the pandemic, 26 chapters across the world, and it's a first hand book which has been done on, um, oh no, not that one, sorry, that's the second one, the second one is the handbook, which is the um, one on leadership, that was 26 chapters which was done within the pandemic, and we got it in on the 31st of March 2021, and we had a year to get it done and did that. The other one, is conceptual. I've done all the conceptual chapters. I've written most of the chapters of the book, and um, it's uh, it's it's looking at. I've called it. Have, these are my terminologies. Sophisticated, because it is sophisticated, and it's everyday racism implications for education work. Now, the key thing about it is well, inside the book there's some gems. So I use the word WWS, and that stands for White Women's Syndrome. And you might think, what's that? read the book. It's about the notions of white virginity and what happens when all of a sudden they feel that they might be uh, a bit more kind of uncomfortable with discrimination than they think. And so all things take place. So I call it WWS. Um, and also there's a gem at the back which is page of chapter number eight which is called Flip the Script and Change the Narrative. So that's a that's a interesting one. So there you go. So what do I do now with this? Can I take do I oh we need to ask <coughs> that. Okay. Um well well thank you Victoria, that was that was fantastic. Thank you for joining me and giving a huge thank you. So what we'll do now is if um we'll we'll take some questions or comments or you know, like it doesn't have to be formal or structure but anything you like to kind of raise or say, you know, you're very welcome. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear from you. If you just wave your hands in the air and then one of our lovely mic people will 
band over to you. If you could wait to start talking until you've got the mic in front of you because we are um, recording and we want to catch what you're saying. Um, those are two really good talks, thank you. Um, so I'm just interested, because um, what's been said in both of those lectures was mainly about like um, student experience or like um, researchers or academics, universities, um, but what also about like other members of staff such as cleaners, janitors, admin and security? Um, like that, and, and a specific question on that as well. So you mentioned how there were um, 17 black academics in UCL. I'm interested what the racial composition of like cleaning staff is at UCL, for instance, and cooks and janitors and security, etc. Thank you. Very good question, actually. Um, I think I think you can all hear me. Um, when I say staff, I include everybody. All oh, right. All right. I'm one of the people, my best friends are the security and the people clean the toilets. I'm very friendly with them. Um, and also the people which, um, who move, you know, if I need to have something done in my room, in a classroom or something else, I know who to talk to. So they are, without them, I wouldn't survive. So they're part of a discussion when I'm looking at that. Um, in relation to uh, how many staff are coming from and those, the backgrounds, the facilities backgrounds. Well, if you want to, if you want to see where black people or Asian people or people of colour just go early in the morning or late at night, that's that's where you see them because they will be at reception, they will be in security, they will be serving the food, all the stuff. So all what you think is what what's happening. But when you get to talk to them, I talk to a lot of people um, in my university, and many of them have got. Masters, PhDs, all these different things, but they can't get the foot on the ladder. Mm. Or they've just got issues with, you know, kind of trying to have their stuff identified as, as good as the British system and all of that. But, yeah. And, um, yes, yeah, so that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah and I'll just um, mention this. I think so what Victoria brought up brilliantly, especially with the onion image, is this notion of culture and this being a very holistic notion. So it wouldn't, you know, on, on the one hand, if you were just going to sort of um, consider these concepts of inclusivity and diversity purely for the sort of students and the, and the stuff, you, you wouldn't be actually even remotely scratching the surface of the problem because, you, are, you know, that is not, I mean, even if you did all wonderful things in every single in department or school, that is still not an inclusive culture make. So I think that's an absolutely really important point to bring up and I thank you for it. You know, it's this idea and again it's this notion that, you know, sort of you might actually be able to achieve some degree of um, horizontal relationships within these spaces, but then if you're still doing this within a hierarchical structure yeah. where there's very clearly a lower pecking order, very clearly that one, it makes a nonsense of it. I just ask a question to build on that. Um, I really liked both the talks, by the way. They were really fascinating and um, really exciting. Um, I work at Rittle, which is a FEHG college in Essex. It's agricultural background. It's very white. Um, and I'm the HE disability manager there. And I'm the first person in that post who also has disabilities. And they're I'm able to craft change and try and get more inclusion around disability because I myself have those needs and I'm having to really fight for those and there's lots of people who are very amenable to that change and really want that change but I'm the first time that, that voice is being represented. We don't have people of colour but basically at all at our university. It's, it's, when you showed that image of the of the white institution, I was like, yep, yeah, that's exactly what we have. The issue of representation, how do we get people to want to come and um, be part of those spaces? Because I've, I found it hard. I've had to fight to be part of that. And I already, like you're saying, having one foot in the door, I know, I'm already 
comfortable to a certain degree in those spaces because of my whiteness. How do we make sure that we can welcome people and make sure that they are not having to fight so hard to become part of that structure so that we can make change? Sorry, that was all I did. Well, um, I'll, I'll start this. So, I mean, like, in, in some ways, this is what, as I, I mentioned, I hold the post widely participation academic officer, and partly these posts are engineered in, in this sort of part of this um, endeavour to try and open open doors and, and sort of start sort of being the catalyst to, to create these spaces. But the reality is it's extremely difficult, because especially with, um, with sort of persons or students of colour, um, you are on the, if you're asking them to be the, come and be the pioneer cohort, that is a huge ask. I mean, that is, that is a, a frightening ask. I suppose, um, I sort of think, but at the same time, you know, like what you're saying is that, you know, sort of what makes you powerful and effective in your role is not only you have an, ins you have an insider and inside insider's knowledge, and therefore you can articulate something in a way that all the kind of good intentions and the promises, you know, you can blast through those and you can start getting nitty gritty into, okay, this is structurally what it looks like. And that is a different conversation to what normally takes place amongst, I think Victoria brought that out really strongly, amongst very well-meaning people. But, you know, this is always the, the crunch point. How far are you actually willing to go to substantiate these values that you're talking about? Um, honestly, there's no uh, sort of simple pathway apart from, I, I suppose, one approach that we've actually had students come to us and say, this is what, you know, we, we would have preferred, we would have liked, and that's total honesty about where you're coming from so that no one's going to be sort of walking in on false promises at all or having unrealistic expectations of what they're going to um, encounter. Um, Victoria, I don't know if you Yeah, I, uh, thank you. I mean, I, I was going to say that um, I think you need to start with the schools and so to have a conversation with the school and see whether um, young people, what you know, how you're going to encourage them to take up the area, the topic which you're, which you're working in, in the further education college. Because I think, especially since the last two years of the pandemic, there's lots of people which are taking up agriculture, um, which are really from a whole mixture of people. And it's really been able to entice that and bring that in, um, into the, from, from the schools into you, or you going into the schools which are in diverse areas. And, and, and because when we think about mental health as a disability, there's going to be many people which would be very interested, who are of colour, would like to come to you. But you need to go to them to kind of say, well, look, this is, and make it, apply it to, to what's going on as well. I listened to the programme on Radio 4, you know, the, the, um, the, the, the programme about, um, Agriculture, basically, and, and I'm, I'm always interested in what the voices are. There was a 16-year-old on there the other day who wants to go into agriculture. So I think I think it's about how you position yourselves. Don't expect them to come to you if you don't go to them, and you really kind of seek out. Because I think people are looking at different ways of what they want to be, um, as as yeah. you know, differently to what they were before the pandemic. I think. Um, so, I guess with regards to, to colonising curriculums, um, so I that UEA I think recently changed the first year module to one called Writing Across Borders, which is part of a decolonising initiative you know, to bring more um, kind of uh, transnational and black authors you know, in. I suppose um, the question is how important do you think it is to study black authors and curriculums? in comparison to having black academics um, teaching them? And uh, what's your opinion on white academics teaching students about black authors? Oh, <laughs> we got some. We got some questions, any ladies? Uh, Jim. Jim, hi Jim. So you've been sitting there very quiet, and now we've got this powerful question coming out. Um, okay, so let's start with the, the, the last one. I don't really care who teaches it, if I'm being honest. But what I do care is that you understand what you're teaching 
and you understand the implications of you teaching it as a white male or as a white female. And I think that's really important, which is the same thing, if I may, is with adoption. I don't mind. However, you need to understand the culture of the young person or the culture of the learners, and so you don't whitewash it. Right? So that's the first thing. The second aspect, which you mentioned about um, the, you know, the decolonizing curriculum. Well, it de depends how you're decolonizing it. If it's just the reading list, if that's a good start, the reading list is a good start, but what else are you doing so you can say that actually we're making this a decolonized curriculum? Are you looking at the pedagogy, how it's being taught? Because of course we all learn differently. Are we, taught, are we looking at that? So I think that's an important part. Um, I learned a different aspect of that, if I may just tell you something. When I was in Brazil, and I was um, doing a really interesting project out there, and it was working with, um, doing research and development with young um, with women in the favelas. Now, of course, I came in myself, privileged self, I tell you, and I wanted to do some work with the group of women within the centre. So of course I'm thinking, oh, we get some paper and we get some pens and we do some writing and all this kind of stuff. One day Portuguese, uh, sorry, yeah, Portuguese language, so no one speaks English, so I had translators. Two, I'm in the favela, right? So here I am thinking, I get people to do some, no. So I have to kind of roll up my sleeve, and this is really important because it's understanding the pedagogy. I roll up my sleeves and I say, okay. There's a space here, there's big pieces of paper here. And I asked them about leadership. I wanted to ask them about leadership within the favela. What do they think of, of who are, are they identified as women as leaders? So I got the paper on the floor, and we got on the floor. And I said, draw, draw the favelas and all the different aspects of what's going on in the favelas. And then think about what do the women do within that. And then we came back into this is leaders, you're leaders. And there was tears. And there was tears for many reasons. Tears because, you know, they've never seen themselves as a leader, but they're leaders, they're leaders of change. This was a center where women have been violent, of violence. And they were the leaders of change within that favela, of ensuring that they bring the police together, bring this together, they're the leaders. But I had to really reflect on myself within minutes and say, come on, to it. You ask them to write, they can't write English. I'm not asking them to write English, but even they can't write Portuguese. So why am I doing that? I have to think about where's this person coming at if I want them to be with me. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Is it alright for me to ask a follow-up question? Yes, sorry, the next bit, yes. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I think that's such a, like, applicable to their lives, kind of, um, as you say, like, the cultural approach. I suppose in a more university setting or a more widespread setting, how would you ensure that um, they're being taught in, I guess, what you say about the liberatory kind of model? How do you how do you ensure that they're being taught, as you say, properly? You know. Well, you see, you might not like my lectures. <laughs> you may not like my lectures because I I'm very interested in purposeful teaching. And if I could just give you a snippet of the type of thing I like to do. So for example, right, um, you're in my class and something's really peed me off for the, for, the, for the week. And so one of the lessons, I write about this, and I was, um, it was the time of 2015. Now, listen, I'm using politics, but don't, don't judge me, right? And um, Pamela just got in again, okay, and I'm going in. And I'm doing minority of migrants and refugees. That's my other module I teach. Minority of migrants and refugees. And we've also had that multiculturalism is dead. And I'm going to the classroom, I've got my books and everything, and I'm thinking, I don't want to be here. I've got something going on. So, put my books down on the side. This helps you with what I'm going to say. I'm a storyteller. Okay. So I come up to you, Jim, and I say, Hi, Jim, what's your name? So, who are you? So well, I'm Jim, I'm da da da, and I say, oh, okay, hi Jim, how are you doing? And then I say to you, I say, what are you doing? You? My name is Natalia. I say, hi Natalia. I say, Natalia, what you, where are you from? I'm from Greece. I say, oh, right, okay. Natalia, do you see yourself as a migrant? No, I'm not a migrant. I don't get 
model, I'm doing model, I'm doing migrants, minorities, migrants, and refugees in my other module. You don't see yourself as a migrant. No. Jim, do you see yourself as a migrant? No, no, no. Do you see me as a migrant? Yes! Hang on a minute, you've been here six weeks. You see me as a migrant, but you not a migrant. How comes that? So that's how my teaching starts. Do you know what I'm saying? The conversation goes in all different directions because all of a sudden you're drawing yourself into the class. Because that, that to me is talking about how you're decolonizing it because I'm bringing your Greekness in, I'm bringing this in, and the person who is Greek then starts to say, I live in Greece in my life, I'm Jewish. She talks about her Jewishness. She wouldn't have talked about that before because I haven't invited her to come in. What I've done is put a lecture up and I've talked to you, but you haven't actually been able to be part of that. So that's part of something you've done. But you've got another question, please speak. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Pop in there um, too, because um, that's a really important point. I mean, colonizing the curriculum. Uh, with decolonizing the curriculum, one of the things which, um, the way I approach it, and some of the struggles I have with it, from Victor Graham would be interested to hear your take on this, but decolonizing is actually something I would strongly sort of perceive. I mean, it's very closely related, but there is a distinction to be drawn between that and racism. Decolonizing talks about a whole kind of <coughs> subset of power, and the idea that, you know, sort of, and actually that that's something which is not, it's not dependent on, on race as a phenomenon, although it is obviously closely associated, and that cannot be sort of overlooked. But, so when I think about decolonizing the curriculum, it is exactly in the way that Victoria is saying. It is about, well, how do you, as a student, actually, you know, how do we break that kind of student-lecturer relationship down and actually think about this as people involved in a learning situation, coming in at different levels, participating at different levels, but all participating. How do I recognise that you've got agency in this situation? And that you're actually not going to learn anything unless I actually recognise that. If I just stand there and preach at you and deliver you a message and then see, I mean, that's not, that's not learning, that's obedience training. If you then, you know, if you then get an A because you repeat it back correctly to me and give me back my image of myself, I've not done my job. So liberatory, that is what I mean by how huge that cultural transformation would have to be to actually make widely participation, widely participation, something that actually means something. Brilliant, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, it sounds like having a student-centered approach makes it good, because I'd say it seems a bit kind of fictitious sometimes well, when it's not like you feel like your own identity has a part to play in it. And yeah, like we're hiding it, like you're not really a person, you're just this sort of blob that's going to something that belongs detached from your own identity when exactly. really I like to think of it as a student partnership model because obviously at the same time, I don't, I mean, some of my problems with student-led or student-centred is actually, well, okay, but someone like, there's been a lot of sort of time and investment in getting me to a position where I actually should be doing something for you. So I like to think of it as a partnership, so that I give you something, you give something back in, and we both take away from it. But the onus isn't all on you, but it's not all on me either. I suppose the question was, um, it, that I'm thinking of now is like, how do you apply that to policy, you know, while still <laughs> making sure that um, teaching quality is kind of met, however you want to interpret what teaching quality and, you know, it being met is. Well, it depends who defines it. Yeah, it also, um, it also depends who defines knowledge. Yeah. Mm. Do you think it should be up to the teacher or the state? Well, let me give you one example. Like, I actually think, for example, if you want to genuinely move towards that culture, but you can't really sort of, the minute you sit there and do a policy saying, everyone's going to teach in the following liberatory manner, you know, game over, loss. Uh, what you could do is actually start interrogating things like grading and assessment. Like, because in some ways, that is sort of what is still holding in thrall a power structure, because you've got someone who can, at the end of the day, is acting as a gatekeeper, saying, yes, you passed, yes, your experience is valid, oh, no, yours not, is not, it's not quite familiar enough to me, I don't quite recognise that, you get a bit lower down. If you, if you were just having these educational experiences and not, you know, sort of, and, you know, not being sort of graded in that particularly stratified, like, I'm not saying, you know, 
get rid of all pass and fail. I mean, obviously, if you're in a medical school, you do need to know if you can actually safely operate on people or not. You know, it's not, but that's very different from going, well, you're a 1A and you're a 2C and all that kind of stuff. So what you could do on a policy level is start to say, well, can we have some more mature conversations about how relevant and necessary that is towards people actual learning or whether that grading system is doing something else that's not entirely connected to learning. That would be one way you could approach it. Yeah, see I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm complex, I'm quite, quite traditional. So I'm kind of a traditionalist in some ways. So I, I, so even when I said to you about the assessment which the students do, which is they're looking at, um, they're doing a critical reflection on autobiographical, using an autobiographical lens of race, they have to, they have to be able to be, uh, provide a theoretical thread all the way through that, which brings it together. And so it's not a descriptive piece, and so it's not a, so it's, a, and that's a difficult piece of work to do. It's not descriptive, it's a critical thinking piece which means you have to draw on different theories. So on the one hand, you think, oh, you know, they come to Victoria's lesson, and it's going to be quite easy. You know, well, it's easy to have the conversation, but then you've got to do the reading, and you've got to make the connections. And because we have been doing it for a long time, it's making those connections. Um, but yeah, the, yeah but you're, you're on the right path, aren't you? And you're a student. What are you with a staff student? PhD, uh, oh, or what? Third year, you said. So. What, PhD student? Uh, third year. Oh, third year, what? Oh, yeah. right, undergrad. Yeah. Oh, right, OK. Thanks. That was yeah, no problem. Yeah, two people at the back there, I think. Like, oh, and then with the curly hair. Run the mic up. Oh, then Alan, yes. Oh. Yeah. I'm pretty loud anyway, so I'm looking at um, <laughs> Thank you both for that talk. That was really thought provoking in the sense that I'm, I've thought two thoughts I haven't thought before. So apologies in advance. If this the questions based on those thoughts are really long-winded and, and not helpful, but um, Victoria, your slide on what why diversity is good made me think about when you were saying about how diversity makes communities strong. I was reflecting on that a bit, and I was thinking, well, when Stalin um, was divvying up the USSR, he divvied people up across ethnic lines because that made their communities weaker. And when the colonists, because ISIS, one of their war cries is something about remembering some treaty of something or other, I can't remember the specifics, but it's about when the colonists in this country included cut great big straight lines across that part of the world in order to separate ethnic groups because that caused conflict and that mm -hmm. caused weakness and the ability to, to be a colonist and an overlord. So with that, I, I suppose that slight like challenge to that point of view in mind, I was wondering about when you're thinking about diversity as a goal in an institution, whether it's a university or anything else, whether there is a, I, I don't know, a natural um, put the tension between the goal of diversity and the goal of power, by which I mean getting things done that you want to achieve. Thinking on a little, I was thinking, well, why, why would that be? And I was thinking, well, is it that I, I, I don't know really, but is it that in order to achieve that goal of diversity and for and like I, the sort of common identity markers like your race or your sexuality or whatever it is, is it that we we have we've had to enforce on ourselves a type of um, conformity of thought? Is that uh, is is that kind of going away from diversity in order to uh, in order to achieve that goal? Is that uh, Judgment, that's a kind of judgment free statement. That is, that, is that something that we need to do? Is that the type of thing that's worth doing in order to achieve those goals? Is it likely to be successful? That was the, the first long winded thing I was going to say. The other long, long, probably slightly less long winded thing was in relation to your talk, Sophie. And I was thinking about the, your top right quadrant of. Um, there's two things actually. The, the top right one is not on there anymore. I'm just trying to remember it. But um, the top right one was about the social, the, the social justice. Is the I was just just questioning. Is that the? Is that uh, I didn't really understand why social justice was the end goal for so for radical change necessarily. Yeah. Like, is it not? Yeah. Like religions and things like that have, have 
had very radical goals that were nothing about social justice. So is that is, is there is there perhaps a, a, a bias in there somewhere? I'm not sure. And then the the only other thing I was thinking was for your um, uh, liber, liber, liberatory. liberatory model is do you think the structures of a university are the right place for that sort of education to happen? That's sorry, that's a lot. <laughs> Thanks, I'll, I'll give this away now. At least he was listening, which was really good. Cool. Do you want to start the last verse? Yeah, sure. Um, so, social justice. Uh, let's let's say that this is justice is what people who would use, who would invoke that model, say that that is what the change is directed to. That is not necessarily a universal standard of justice that we would all necessarily agree on. So, for example, someone. Um, who is of a say um, artsy and persuasion might have a very might say well you know obviously the end goal of this is justice because it results in sort of maximum equality and therefore maximum productivity and therefore maximum social prosperity these are all jolly good things however that you know from that kind of you can flip that upside down bring back Stalin because why not we don't get enough Stalin in public lectures. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And then so, you can so, sort of say, well, okay, yes, but you know, just social justice does not look like what happened in the Soviet Union, you know, during the sort of Stalinist period, shall we say? So, so I think that model is sort of using that. It's sort of using that as a, it's sort of not saying necessarily that you would always agree that that was justice, but you would say that possibly people thinking in those directions are motivated by this sense that you know that this is. Um, this is currently problematic, or you know, there, this, there are various problems that, if we resolved, would. I think very few people, really, you're talking. I, I suppose it's possible, but a relative minority of people would kind of say, you know, what I really want to make changes for the worst. You know, I think most people would assume that even if you violently disagreed with them, their vision was ultimately a better. But people might say, I want to make changes for myself. Um, they they might well do. In which case, you know that those changes again, it's about degrees of intensity. I mean, if you're thinking that box was particularly referring to large scale social change, and you would probably be wanting to make changes down on the other quadrant, which was saying, um, well, I'm not really bothered about the whole the whole fabric in society of society really works, but I definitely want to make life better for myself within it, even if that means radically reorganising the process. Well, I put Thatcherism in the top right, didn't you? Was because Thatcherism that was a that whole social project? Um, a, a, a rugged <coughs> individualism? It, like well, yes, it was, but it was also chasing the tail of what she thought and where she thought the market was going. So it was a catch-up operation right. yeah. as well. So the, to a degree, that would be change, absolutely, and it would be wholesale social change. But I would say, arguably, it would come down here because it wasn't wanting to sort of radically transform the culture for a fundamental change in overall values. What it was wanting to do is say, well, the world is going this direction, Britain's getting left behind, we better chase tail, I would mm. argue. But we can take yeah. that up um, at some other time. With the, with the other point, just quickly, is the university the right space for this? Well, of course it is. Historically speaking, the universities didn't trot people through hoops. They were actually, I mean, this is a little bit romanticized, and you can criticize this very strongly, but they ran on scholarly guild principles. So the group, and that's actually, you know, sort of how, to some fairly impoverished degree, it still vaguely functions. I'm looking at my head of school here. You know, within school, it's like we will still do things like get together, and you know, the culture we have amongst ourselves and amongst postgraduates, there is no reason to think that the sort of fundamental core elements of having those conversational approaches, of having those exchanges, of having that sort of collegial approach, oh my god, I'm stretching it, aren't I? But um, the, 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 there's a ghost of it that still remains, and certainly there was a legacy of it within the kind of broader history of the university. The university has not always been like this. As it were, so it's per and these also they are actually very practical. It is actually far more practical to think in terms of learning processes and teaching people how to be thinkers rather than what to think. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, so I, I think that's a good note to, to pass <laughs> Yeah. 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 Thank you. So yeah, I keep, I keep, um, 
See, this is a thing when you wear a dress and you don't wear a shirt or you don't wear a tie, you see. These things don't fit on. Um, so really, to tell you what, what you were saying, um, I was thinking about um, around the community setting and um, and who, you know, the tension between power and, what, and whether you give it up or you don't give it up. Um, and uh, I was thinking, Alan, um, that if you are up in one of those squares, with a square, and um, you've got social justice as the end result, and at the same time you're coming in to do X, Y, and Z, and theoretically, you're very much wanting to make change happen, transform the organisation, the university, until someone says you need to give something up, which could be, we're going to pass, you, you, you know, you're not going to get the promotion, we're going to give it to this person, because, you know, there's not enough women in, in, in the department which have really progressed. All of a sudden, I would argue, and I don't know you very well, that um, the pleasantness of social justice kind of goes out the window a little bit, because why would that happen? Why would I then have to give up my hard work to the person over here because of the numbers of the fact that women aren't getting the numbers? Does that make sense? So I suppose what I'm saying to you is that there's a, um, we come back to the fact of, is the university the right place? Well, it is the right place. Because you're able to have these kind of conversations, critical conversations about issues to do with equality, whatever equality looks like. You're also able to um, look at that tension between power and think, as one sits as a, as a white female next to me, um, there is going to be an area of tension and discussion, not between us, but between what's going on here within your minds as well, trying to work things out within the space of the university. Doing this within the, in the workplace is a bit more difficult. A bit more, even though this is a workplace for people because people are working here. But do you know what I mean? So, um, and, and, and I need to think about more about what you've asked me. So what I'd, be, I'd like you to do is write to me and so I can have a debate with you about it, because I think, I think there's some really interesting stuff, but what, what came up first thing really was, what would you give up? And there's a lot of, that's what a lot of discussion is about, is how we, when we're starting to diversify the curriculum or do critical race theory, if I bring that into the room, many of the so-called liberal people, parents, in certain parts of the country, including this country, don't want to see CRT because they think it's going a step too far because it's about power and tension within an educational establishment. I'm just I could have more with him, but I've talked to him. Um, you need to, to, no. to email. Um, oh, that's that's great. Great. But, well, no, there's a couple of questions at the back, so we'll sort of, we need to um, vaguely aware of time. So if we go to the back now, Oh, hello. Hello. Hi. Um, yeah, so I guess my question um, relates to the previous one, um, but I'll change it up a bit. Um, so, yeah, Victoria, your um, idea about diversity. Um, so, yeah, my question was about, um, you know, what, what diversity looks like when it's done well. Um, in a way that's not about maintaining the status quo. Can we actually, you know, should we be actually talking about diversity in the first place? Um, because, you know, one of your slides was about it, you know, it, it favours a, a particular group and that is not people of colour. Um, and so um, in my school, which is the school that I think it's Tim at the front, is part of the white, uh, Writing Across Borders module that was mentioned. So I'm the, I should say I'm the decolonising lead in that school. Um, so we're talking about decolonising um, because, as far as we're concerned, um, you know, that's, that's kind of more radical. It's about saying, actually, we don't accept the system as it is. 
um, and let's kind of intervene and kind of overhaul things. Um, so I guess, you know, there are conversations about diversity which are perhaps valid, um, but there are also arguments about the fact that diversity is just really about saying, you know, we want these other people to join our party and let's keep things exactly as they are. Um, and, um, but you know, when you join, um, don't expect to mess things up too much and bring your strange ways, thank you very much. Um, so, um, so yeah, I'm just really interested in that, in those <coughs> terms about diversity and, and how we, you know, how we are to understand that and make that, that work. Thank, thanks, Claire. That's really helpful. Sorry, you finished? Yeah. All right, sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm going to jump in there, then I'll, I'll let you go in a little. Oh, I don't need it. Um, I, I think it'd be clear to me, I don't use the word diversity very often. Um, I only used it because I was asked about it or whatever. So um, I find the word diversity has been used so often, no one knows what it means. And so I'd rather be honest about the fact what is it I'm trying to do. Um, now, I'm a feminist, so my work is around gender. But I always get introduced as a race expert, but actually my research is on gender. Um, and that in itself is on tensions. Um, so regarding what you're saying, I think what you're doing in the area you're doing, or all the areas, is you do need to medicalize the actual, um, uh, the readiness of what's actually going on with the students. And I think the word radicalization is actually quite a useful word. And I'm not using it in a whole way. I'm using it in the fact that you need to do that. I, was a, I, I did my master's in women's studies, no, gender studies. And um, the reading list, they didn't want me to use bell hooks at the time because they said that she was not scholarly enough. All right? They said it was not scholarly enough. But they were okay to use Audrey Lord, but not bell hooks. And so it is important, but I suppose what I was trying to say as well, Claire, is that it needs to also be in a, in a framework. Because when we are looking at the different readings, as an example, it needs to be in a framework so people can actually say, well, okay, we're talking about um, philosophy, so why don't we use Fanon? And why don't we use Du Bois? Why don't we use Frederick Douglass, as an example? Why are we using all white males as philosophers? Because there are a whole range of philosophers which have been around besides these guys. So let's do that. So I think it's, I suppose what I'm saying, I'm agreeing with what you're saying, but we have to do it in a framework. So when your students come to you and they want to quote some philosophers and I'm having to read something, I'm thinking, you know, I'm falling asleep because I want you to kind of jazz it up a bit, get some other people's ideas in here which are not just white. Now, I'm not next to a philosopher, but I've got a lot of friends which are philosophers as well. So, I mean, yeah, we have that debate, and it's beyond to have that debate. Does that help, Claire? Yeah. Well, I think we've got one more question, and then. Yeah. yeah. Thank you both very much uh, for today. Um, you have already answered my question uh, when you said that it's not about. Um, uh, telling uh, your university students what to think, but how to think. Um, I am in initial teacher education, working with secondary trainee English teachers. So you've answered my question about the priorities, but the challenges um, as well in secondary education and the narrow definitions of knowledge and learning. So thank you very much for that. Well, no, I think that's, um, that's actually a really lovely note to, to end on. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to just thank Victoria again for a fantastic presentation. And thank you all for coming out tonight and being such a great participatory audience. It's wonderful. It is events like this which makes us think that, you know, there is actually meaning behind these words, inclusivity, diversity, when we can actually sort of see on a small scale maybe, but how it actually does manifest in practice. So thank you all very much and have a lovely evening.